I'm pleased to be working with Macduff Marine Aquarium to help raise awareness around plastic pollution in our oceans. For me, my journey as an ocean advocate began rather surprisingly. I actually decided that I wanted to train as an architect when I was at school and I went off to university to do just that. And it wasn't until I finished my degree that I lined up my first job as an architect in Australia. But I decided I wanted to get there from England without taking an aeroplane. So I ended up looking at that map, England to Australia, 14,000 nautical miles. And I thought, how am I gonna get there? And decided to try and hitchhike on a boat. And that's when I came across a project called Earth Race, a boat that runs on 100% biofuel. I had broken the round the world speed record, but was now about to go around the world a second time to visit 120 cities, to talk to schools, politicians and media about renewable energy. So I wrote to the skipper and I said, how do I get a job on board this boat? And he said, come to Brighton in South England and we'll see how you get on. And so I showed up in Brighton with enough stuff to last me for a weekend and I didn't end up going home for another 923 days. So I got on board this amazing looking rocket ship style boat and off we went across the Atlantic Ocean, across through the Panama Canal and then into the Pacific. And we got welcomed into amazing remote communities but there were so many things that I was never expecting to see on this trip around the world. And one was actually being woken in the night by the sound of something hitting the hull of our boat. And when I came up on deck, it turned out that we were surrounded by pieces of plastic. Now at the time, we were 800 miles from nearest land. So the closest people to us were actually in the space station in orbit above our heads. And yet there was this evidence of human life and waste in the most remote part of the Pacific. We stopped at remote islands and we found that the locals were struggling to catch fish because the commercial vessels had emptied their waters of the fish they knew how to catch. They were struggling to grow food in the ground because their rising sea levels had caused their soil to become so salty that their crops wouldn't grow. But the knock-on effect of this was a new reliance on importing packaged food and drink that all came wrapped up in this new strange material, plastic. And with nowhere for that plastic to go, it ended up getting dumped on beaches, thrown in the ocean, and sometimes burnt. And it was that really toxic burning smell that kept getting up my nose on all of these islands. And I wanted to know more about what it was. And I then learned about these chemicals that are released when you burn plastic in this way and how they can impact our bodies, our health, they can lead to cancer. And they're really chemicals that we and the kids living on this island in the South Pacific really didn't want inside our bodies. In between each of these islands, we had days, weeks, months of this open ocean. And we would sit on the roof of Earth Race, looking out at the curvature of the Earth on the horizon. And it was out here for me that things started to change. Because one of the things I love about being at sea it's how you constantly have to react to the changes around you. So the wind changes direction or the waves start getting bigger and you have to adjust your sails, you shift your course. And sometimes your life depends on the response that you take. And it made me start thinking about my own course, my career. And 
I suddenly realised that I didn't want to go and be an architect and build buildings, but I actually wanted to tackle this issue of plastic that I was seeing everywhere I went. So I went back to this little island in Tonga and started to work on the ground on a waste management system. I got to know the locals to find out what they thought about all this plastic on their beaches. And I quickly discovered that they didn't even have a word in their language for rubbish or bin. The idea of throwing something away into a controlled system, it didn't exist because a banana peel, a coconut husk could be thrown on the ground with no consequence that it had never been thought of before. So it wasn't only infrastructure that these islands needed, but a whole new way of thinking about this new inorganic material. So after six months of working with the schools, we culminated in an enormous cleanup event. And we had 3,000 people, which was three quarters of the population, come together. And we picked up 56 tonnes of plastic in just five hours. Now that's probably enough to fill up a school gym. It's so much rubbish and it absolutely staggered me. I just couldn't believe it. And it was not only the domestic waste from the local people who were relying on this imported food, but it was also every morning when I walked along the beach, I was seeing plastic washing up. And when I picked up these pieces of plastic, I realized that the writing on the labels was in languages that I didn't even recognize. So this got me asking more questions. Where was that plastic coming from? And how is it ending up all the way on this little beach in the South Pacific. And so I started to learn more about the way that we use plastic and really the sheer volume of how much is produced and thrown away every day. Now this counter here shows the number of plastic bags that we're using in the world right now. That's how quickly it's going up. And those bags, they get used once, maybe twice, probably three times at best, and then they're thrown away. And that's the thing about plastic. It's an amazing material because it lasts forever. But we go and make things like plastic bags and water bottles that are designed to be used just once and then thrown away. And it's that mismatch of material science and product design that puts us in this situation of having huge amounts of waste material that no longer have any use or any value. So then I thought, couldn't we just recycle all of that plastic? Can't we turn it back into new things? But it turns out only 9% of the plastic that we use actually gets recycled. And that number is so low because plastic is a word that we give as a name to hundreds of different materials. And they all have different properties. Some of them are stretchy, some are hard, they might be clear or coloured. But to give them all of those different properties, they need to have a different chemical structure. But when you recycle plastic, you can only take one type at a time to get a good quality product at the other end. So all this plastic, it needs to be cleaned and sorted. And then you come across something like a toothbrush that's got three or four different types of plastic stuck together into one object, which makes it completely impossible to recycle. So all this waste with nowhere to go, lots of it goes to landfill, but a surprising amount of it escapes and it finds its way down streams, drains, rivers that ultimately run downhill to the ocean. When they get to the ocean, they then follow these ocean currents and end up in these hot spots around the world. We have five 
of these spots in our oceans and we call them gyres and they are accumulation zones where because of those ocean currents all of the plastic eventually ends up in the middle. Now I was becoming increasingly intrigued with where this plastic was going and how it was moving around the planet. So after that project in Tonga in the Pacific, I decided to set off back to sea to try and find some answers to all of these unanswered questions. And so we set off to sail to the South Atlantic accumulation zone. We left Brazil heading towards Africa and we got out to the middle of this gyre, the place where we were expecting to find all of this plastic that we knew was leaving land. But what surprised us when we got there is actually, it was beautiful and blue. We could see a piece of plastic here and another piece over there. We got our nets out on board and we started pulling up some pieces. And by the end of the first day, we had about 30 pieces of plastic piled on the boat. But it didn't make any sense because we know that 8 million tonnes of plastic is going into our ocean every year and we could only find these 30 pieces. Where was the rest of the plastic going? Now it turned out the plastic was there, we just couldn't see it. It was too small. So we built a manta trawl a big piece of metal with wings like a manta ray and a net, a very fine mesh net off the back. And when we pulled that along the surface of the ocean and brought it back on board and turned it inside out, we found hundreds of tiny fragments of plastic, what we call microplastics. They're smaller than your little fingernail and they make up the majority of the plastic in the ocean. They're not biodegrading and they're not going back into the natural circle of life. When they get smaller from the UV rays of the sun and the wind and the waves, they're simply getting into smaller pieces that are much harder to see and much, much harder to clean up. When we bring the samples on board, we then analyze them and we try and work out what's plastic and what's plankton the fish food that's floating on the surface of the ocean as well. And it turns out in this slide that these two pieces are actually plastic and they look almost identical to the plankton. So then we started catching fish and we found things like this rainbow runner that actually had 17 fragments of plastic inside its stomach, plastic that it had mistaken for food. So at this point, we started asking more questions about how has that plastic got into the food chain? And if we're at the top of that food chain, then what might it mean for the health of us as well? And so there's very little evidence that connects the bottom to the top of this food chain, but I thought I'd skip right to the end and actually find out which of these chemicals that we're finding in plastic and the ocean also might be inside my body. And when I had a blood test, we looked for 35 chemicals that are banned by the United Nations. And of those 35 chemicals, we found 29 of them inside my body. Now this I found really shocking. I think mostly because when we're talking about environmental problems, we're usually talking about something that's happening somewhere else that we're watching on TV, that's maybe happening somewhere far away that's gonna affect us maybe in the future. But this test made me realize that actually already we have a chemical footprint, something that we will never get rid of. And at the moment, the levels of chemicals aren't alarmingly high that we need to be worried about our health but it's a scary indicator of the direction that things are heading. So this sparked a whole new series of voyages for me called X Expedition, an all women sailing mission to look at plastic and toxic pollution in our ocean and also our bodies. And at the moment we are sailing around the world 
to understand really what plastic is out there in our ocean and where's it coming from so that we can stop it getting there in the first place. I want to share with you some clips of our sailing expedition across the North Pacific Gyre, which is better known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We set sail with 14 women from Hawaii to sail to Vancouver, right through the heart of the Gyre. Here's a little of what we found when we got to Hawaii. Today we're on the east coast of Oahu and we're looking at what plastic is washing in. Oahu, one of the Hawaiian islands, really sits on the edge of the North Pacific Gyre that we're going to be sailing to next week. Plastic on this beach, it literally could have come from anywhere across the Pacific. America, Canada, Asia. A lot of it is single-use plastic, a lot of containers. Right here we've got a toothbrush. We've got a couple of pieces here which are interesting. You'll actually see along here that there are some teeth marks. Today's been brilliant because it's the first day that our X Expedition North Pacific crew have all come together. The crew is made up from amazing women from all over the world. We have six different nationalities, but most importantly, a really diverse skill set. We have got journalists, artists, scientists, teachers, filmmakers, policymakers, and product designers. So people who can both look at the challenge, share that message, and also think about solving it. So we set off along the southerly shore of Oahu and we were in the shelter from the island. And then came the point when we turned the corner to feel the full brunt of the trade winds rushing across the Pacific. And the team on board were incredible. They came from all different skills and backgrounds, but not many of them were sailors. So the first week was a real challenge for everybody on board. And you can see how they were getting on 48 hours in. In the last 48 hours, we've had wind waves. Rocking and a rolling. The food has been delicious. Eaten a lot, slept a lot, and helmed a lot. Very wavy conditions last night. Gusted up to 40 knots. In a squall in the middle of the night. Full moon and stars. I've never been so afraid of drinking water. Not being sick, being sick. More sick than expected. Grew up in the wrong direction and got sick on my forehead. Challenges of trying to cook noodles at a 45 degree angle. I'm trying to use what we were at a 45 degree angle. I think I've seen a turtle. I managed to cook some lunch in my underwear. I'm singing Fleetwood Mac up to my lungs. I really enjoy everyone here and their company makes me a kind of a release about that sickness. It's been wonderful. And we're almost heading in the right direction for the gyre. <laughs> so life living at 45 degrees was a huge challenge, but as you can see, the team dealt with it well with a lot of humor on board. But then on day six, the sun came up and we could see over the side of the boat and the mood on board really changed. We've been sailing through the North Pacific Gyre for seven days and we can't believe what we've seen. Plastic bottles, these brushes, plastic bags, buckets and barrels. A lot of rope, more pieces of rope, nylon rope. More constant stream of small bits of plastic. A cigarette lighter, fishing crates. Micro, micro, micro plastic. We saw one huge fishing net tied up together. Seeing these beautiful dolphins and then chunks of plastic next to them. It's the sheer amount of pieces. It's literally a plastic soup. Large plastic lids for containers. A washing basket. Half a toilet seat. We saw a chair with all four legs. All these items once belonged to someone and they definitely don't belong in the ocean. This is that large net that you could see in that video and it always amazes me how the marine life then comes and congregates around it and the algae come and comes and attaches to the ropes and the other bits of plastic and then the little fish come to feed on that and that attracts the bigger fish and then the even bigger fish which is why Anna jumped in behind me on shark watch to check that nothing was lurking down there as we attach a satellite tracker to uh, this big piece of net. But as I mentioned earlier, the biggest problem is actually the smaller pieces. So here's a little bit of what we do around the work on microplastics. We're in the very middle of the North Pacific Gyre. And when we look out at sea, it looks like a beautiful blue ocean. It's only when we put this trawl through the water with a very fine mesh net, do we realize that actually most of what we're looking at right now 
is covered in these tiny fragments. We deploy the trawl for 30 minutes at a time and we're taking a tiny slice, just this wide for a mile, which just makes you wonder really how many are out here in this vast ocean. The samples we're collecting on board are gonna be used for a number of things. Some will go back to Hawaii Pacific University to be analyzed for the toxic chemicals that are adhering to the surface of the plastic. The rest of the samples are being analyzed right here on board Sea Dragon. We're looking at pellet, fragment, film, line, and foam. Once we work out what these plastics are, we can better understand where they're coming from and how to stop them getting into the ocean. And we now know that over five trillion fragments of plastic are floating on the surface of our ocean. And many times that have sunk to the depths in a place so deep that we can't even measure what's going on down there. And it makes us realize that trying to clean up this plastic mess is the most impossible challenge. And that right now our opportunity is to turn off the tap, to start at the source and stop any more plastic getting out there in the first place. And so all of our efforts are now focusing on land, working with individuals on changing mindsets, working with governments on changing policies, and working with companies on developing new solutions and innovations that eliminate single-use plastic out of our supply chain. Thank you so much for listening to some of my adventures around the world. I hope that you've all been inspired to take action on plastic pollution and think about how you can use the power that you have to be part of solving this problem. The more I've worked on this issue, the more I've realized that there's not one solution to all of this. But the great news is there are hundreds and we need to be doing all of them, just one or two of them each, to be minimizing the single use plastic that we all use every day and to maybe going beyond that to see how we can influence others and their plastic usage as well. Mm -hmm.